can sit on the floor. There's, the congregation was nice enough to leave several pews open, so there's room for everybody to sit. If they want. I think we got everybody, don't we? All right. Good morning. So it's, as Matt said, it's Mother's Day, right? That's why we have all the moms up here. First off, ladies, thank you for bringing your young people to church. We always appreciate having them here. So, you know, there's an old saying that says it takes a, and actually in the last 30 years or so, it has become a very common saying that it takes a village to raise a child. So despite the fact that these are the ladies who are in charge of raising you, it's taken a lot of different people to raise you and nurture you and teach you. You know, there's dads, of course, and grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles and teachers in school and and the nurses and doctors that care for you, just tons of people, really. And uh, so for us, we could say it takes a congregation to raise you, because that's really true. This congregation loves having you here and is dedicated to raising you. And just like your moms, who bring you to church, we think it's important to teach you what we know about Jesus and about God. And most especially... Uh, that we know that Jesus is a way for us to be with God all the time, and that Jesus loves you and God loves us no matter what happens to us, whether we're having good times or we're having bad times. When we celebrate, God is there celebrating with us, like on Mother's Day. And when we are having tough times and we're sad, then God is there with us, and he's sad then also. What a great noise. I love that. <laughs> so let's have a, uh, a prayer together. and then, Gracious Lord, we ask these ladies to come forward this morning because we find their children precious in our midst, and we want to thank them for bringing them to us and for entrusting us at least for some periods of each week with their care. We hope that they all learn that Jesus loves them, and that Jesus loves, as the saying goes, all the children of the world. We ask you it would be with them, that you would bless them, bless their families, and especially on this Mother's Day, that you would bless their mothers. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can take your moms back to their seats now. You might want to give them a hug on the way for Mother's Day.
One of those ways that we worship the Lord's holy name is through our gifts and our offerings. I invite our ushers to wait upon us at this time. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the beauty of this spring day, the reminder of life that we see all around us. On this day, we give special thanks for the mothers in our lives, and indeed, Lord, we thank you for all of the women who lead and inspire and challenge and nurture. We're grateful for the gifts that they are to us. Lord, we pray this day that you will especially be with the eighth graders from Sturgeon Bay who are traveling to uh, Washington, D.C. We ask that you will watch over them, keep them safe, and give strength and courage to their chaperones as they care for them. (laughs) Gracious God, we thank you for all of the joys that we experience, and we come to you with the concerns that we carry. So many of us have people that we love and care deeply for that, that are grieving that are being treated for serious illness. We pray, Lord, that you will give us the wisdom and the compassion to serve them as we seek to serve you. We offer all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated.
scripture reading today is from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 8 through 17. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight, then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. But at this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. A lot of people have been thanking me for the uh, cookies this morning, so in interest of full disclosure, I have to admit that Barb made almost all of them last night. But she gave me good advice. She said, take this one little batch to church and put them in the oven in the morning, and that way the place will smell like you cooked them all there. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> I recently read an article by a lady named Margaret Renkel, and it was called The Mother's Day Trap. Now, I think uh, Ms. Renkel must be about my age. Uh, she says she grew up in Alabama in the 60s, and I started high school in New Jersey in 1960. So I could identify with some of the things that she had to say. She says in Alabama in the 60s, all the women that she knew stayed home and took care of babies and she assumed that was to be her life as well. Even though, fact was, she admired the few professional women that she knew and she wanted to be one herself in the worst way, she understood that even these women were not defined by their jobs or their careers, but rather by motherhood. Having children was to be her crowning glory. She was born to be a mother just as her mother was and just as her father told her he was born to be a father. So that's the way it turned out for her. Despite juggling a very successful professional career, she did fulfill the role of mother as she had three sons. And for her, the circle of life seemed to be completed, seemed to be closed. But then they grew up and they left home. Now, they still loved their mother, and they called, and they wrote, and they visited, but she wasn't the one that had to take care of them anymore. In hindsight, she realized that that life circle of her children intersected only very briefly with hers. And that, she says, is the Mother's Day trap. God help the woman, she says, who feels too acutely that motherhood defines her. Now, on Mother's Day, when her children send her flowers or come to visit her, she, she misses the time when they were little, when the bouquets were dandelions and weeds from the garden, and the cards were scribbled with crayon. She vaguely, she's old enough like me, that she vaguely remembers a time when everyone still lived in Grandma's house. And I, I kind of can remember that. We lived near our grandparents, and and our great-grandparents lived there in the same house with them. But these times are no longer with us. Our society has become much more mobile. Now, that's not a value judgment, that's just a fact of life. There's not very many of us who live in the town in which we grew up. It's been a couple of generations at least since that has been the case. And so, Ms. Renkel, caught in what she sees as a trap, 
looks for a new identity. What she wonders comes after motherhood. I share this not because I agree with all her points or have a solution for her, but because it seems to intersect in some odd way with our scripture passage from Ruth chapter 1, which is our 40 challenge chapter for the week. Kathleen Robertson Farmer calls the book of Ruth an artistically constructed kaleidoscopic narrative. That's hard to say. In plain language, it means it's a really short book, only has about four chapters, has lots of different levels of meaning, and it kind of tells us uh, the, how we really are versus how we think we ought to be. Briefly, the story goes like this, in case you haven't read it. There's a drought and famine in Judah, and Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two sons migrate to Moab to find food and to find work. The two sons grow up and marry Moabite women. In the course of things, Elimelech dies, then the two sons die, and so Naomi is left a widow with two daughters-in-law who are also widowed, named Ruth and Orpah. And every time I practice this, I want to say Oprah, but it's Orpah. <laughs> Naomi hears that the famine in Judah is over, and so she decides, since she is is left by herself with no support, to return there to find what family she can to take care of her. She tells Ruth and Orpah to stay in Moab where, where their families are so that they might remarry since they are still young and have children. She tells them they have to go back to their mother's homes and that their families will find for them new husbands. Now this sounds a little strange to us, but it was not unusual uh, in that day and age. That's the way their society worked. They beg to stay with her because they've become attached to her, but she tells them that she has nothing to offer them. I am bitter, I am angry, and I am without hope, she tells him. I can no longer be a mother, and so my life is over. But you are young. You can start over again. So go to your mother's homes. Orpah does as she's told and returns to her maternal home. But Ruth decides to defy custom and tradition, and she says, no, I love you, and we'll go wherever you go and accept what other, what, whatever fate awaits the two of us. A good example of unconditional love for us on this Mother's Day. Naomi is lost. She is dead to all that is good in, in life. And Ruth becomes the agent of her redemption. And the rest of the story is really about God's mercy and grace and how Ruth finds a husband, Boaz, who cares for her and for Naomi. And then we are told that Ruth is an ancestor of David. And of course, in the Gospel of Matthew, she's listed in the genealogy of Jesus. Now, generally, when we read this story, we see ourselves as Ruth, the one who defies tradition and takes the unexpected way. She's the hero of the story, after all. In truth, we are often, like Naomi, lost and in need of redemption, dependent on God's grace. Now, we may identify ourselves as Superman, but in truth, we are much more like Jimmy Olsen. So are we all victims of the Mother's Day trap? Do we all set superhero expectations for ourselves? And does the meaning somehow go out of our lives when those goals no longer apply? Is retirement, for example, a similar kind of trap? Naomi is in need of redemption because of the very way that she identifies herself. The meaning in her life came from being a mother and a wife. And when this was over, she felt that her life was over. And we, male and female, may identify ourselves in much different ways these days than she did, but many of us will still face the same problem at some time in our life and will feel just as lost as Naomi. Just as Naomi found her redeemer in Ruth and in Boaz, we can find our redeemer in Jesus. Jesus Christ is an unearned gift who brings to us God's mercy and grace. He saves us from ourselves. If we look closely 
at what Jesus has to say to us and what he did for us with his suffering and death on our behalf, we can see that it is love, unearned and unconditional love, that is the most important thing. Ruth showed Naomi that her life should be defined by love and not by bitterness and pain. And I would suggest to Ms. Renkel that the solution to the Mother's Day trap is found in the very thing that makes motherhood so fulfilling. We should define ourselves not by the roles that we play in life, but rather by the love that we give and experience. If we define ourselves as those called to love our God and to love other people, then we'll never be disappointed by failing to reach career goals or passing by our life goals. Because no matter what our age is, no matter what our skill level is, no matter what our circumstances of life, God is with us and we can love and be loved. And finally, what about Orpah? We kind of forget about her because she's a minor character in this play, but maybe we should take another look. Because, like I said, we're not all superheroes and we do not all make the exceptional choices in life. And really, we're not always like Naomi, who sees nothing but failure and misery in our future. Many of us are Orpahs. We make the logical rather than the exceptional decisions. We fall somewhere in the middle. Now, my mother and my wife and my three daughters are all talented women who chose to be mothers and teachers and healers, all roles that society finds to be very normal and very acceptable. But does that make them any less than those who make the wilder kind of decisions? Or to put it another way, perhaps those who choose to build ships rather than to sail the seven seas are heroes also. The bottom line on this Mother's Day, I suppose, is that we are really all special in God's eyes. God's love, like a mother's love, does not need to be earned. It just is. That's the very definition of grace, and it's why it's very appropriate that in Christian churches we celebrate Mother's Day not as a trap, but rather as a gift of joy. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful God, we recognize there are many nuances to this story of Ruth and Naomi. Just as the celebration of motherhood and family is not quite as simple and easy as it might appear. But even so, we do not see any of this as a trap, but rather as an offering of your grace and love. So we thank you for this gift, and we pray this morning for all those in our lives who provide love and nurturing, particularly our mothers. May you bless them and bring peace and joy into their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.